Yeah, thank you. So we were talking about software changes. So the same is, um, happens for serverless functions as well. So there are some bugs, so you have to fix some bug. Um, there's some security issues in the library, so you have to update the used library version, or you simply implement some new features. And in any of these cases, uh, it's hard when you're not presenting on your own notebook. Um, so in any case, there's source code version one and source code version two, and there's some change. And I'm not talking about the functional requirements, so that the expected output matches the actual one. I'm talking about the non-functional requirement. And my key question is, how would you measure and quantify the performance change? So in this git commit, for example. And many of you would now instantly re resort to the traditional benchmarking approach. And you would deploy the first version of your function to some kind of cloud provider. Then you would run some artificial benchmark, uh, some artificial workloads, so you do some benchmark, and call the function several times. And then you end up with these measurements and values between, so execution time where measurements between 400 and 600 milliseconds. And that's because of the random fluctuations there. So from the client perspective, it's random fluctuations. And you don't have, uh, so you don't can say which compute unit will be used. You have no influence on the network delay and so on. And I already see them. So. Okay. And you do the same with the second version as well. And you also have a, a wide confidence interval there, a wide uh, measurement range. And if you want to compare them now, you can run some statistical analysis. And you have to be careful there because um, there's, these values do not follow a normal distribution. So you have to pick up the right statistical method. And for our paper, we took, uh, we did this with bootstrapping, percentile intervals. And when you run this bootstrapping, you end up with, a perf why is this going on? I was not pressing anything. Um, you end up with a performance change somewhere between 1.6 and 12.3%. So it's a wide range. You cannot say, okay, this is the change. You detect some change, but you cannot precisely quantify it. And so this is the baseline we want to improve. And our idea was to improve it by run both function versions on the same compute instance. So that's when it's the same compute instance, it's like influenced by the random, uh, by the same random fluctuations. And this is hard to guarantee in the cloud environment, but we have a trick. And yeah, so it would be better if we can reduce this. And our trick is called copy and paste. Um, we create a new function and we copy paste the source code of the first version in there and the second version directly below. So when, when you execute this wrapper function now, um, you can guarantee that both function versions are executed on the same instance. <laughs> Um, but there's a drawback. Okay, there's a drawback because function one now uh, suffers from code starts and function two would be preferred. Um, so you throw a coin and either execution, execute version one or two first to mitigate this. And the next step, you like track the time. So to get the fine grade measurements. And this could already work. So because now you have an execution pair, a measurement pair between version one and version two, um, but why just one? Let's do a loop around. And then you have multiple pairs and this execution method is called randomized multiple interleaved trials. Um, Abidi and Recht had shown that this can lead to very precise results uh, in cloud environments for micro benchmarks. And we adopted this now for the serverless domain. And for this, we deploy this wrapper function multiple times. So we not just evaluate one compute instance, but several. And yeah, this is our open source prototype. You can find it on GitHub. And three components, there's the wrapper, uh, the function wrapper. Doing this wrapper magic, I just explained. So this copy paste magic. And um, it prints or it outputs some deployment artifacts on zip. You can use this zip then to deploy it on some fast provider. Um, faster bench supports um, AWS Lambda and Google Cloud Functions. Then it runs some load um, against these deployed functions, gets the results, and the analysis component does the bootstrapping. Um, yeah, I hope you remember the uh, results from the third slide, I guess. Um, so that was a traditional approach. When you use the faster bench approach and RMIT, you have still a wide range of um, 
yeah, of values, but there's always a link between version one and version two, and you can use this in the, in the statistical method there in this hierarchical bootstrapping. And when you run this, you end up in, with a performance change somewhere between 2.2 and 2.6%. So it's very accurate. Um, yeah, I have to hurry up. Um, yeah, we did a lot of experiments. You can see the results in our paper. Um, but faster bench um, helps you to improve your benchmarks there. And we did a lot of parameter combinations there. And for our function, uh, a good setup was to use three loops, um, deploy the wrapper function five times, and call each of these wrapper function 10 times. So in total, you have 150 measurement pairs um, to get this accurate result. Um, yeah, so it's all fine. Uh, we have, we want to, uh, so in future work, we want to extend this work and support more platforms. And we have, so in the state of the workshop paper, we have two issues or uh, weak points. Uh, you can see both in this pseudocode example. Um, so imagine there's some call to some database system with some key. And when the second version now comes, um, the, uh, the value might already be cached or something like that. So the second version will perform faster. And um, in this kind of situation, we want to exclude um, some parts of the source code. And the second issue is that, so here's some operation performed on this list, right? The list is sorted. When version, now, version two now sorts the same value, the list is already sorted and it's faster. So there's a, the second weak point, but as a kind of sneak preview, I can say that we solve both issues and we are currently working on an extended version. So am I in time? Okay. Uh, one minute. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions? Okay. I think we have time. Yes, we have time. Thank you. Uh, did you did you consider cold start in your experiments? Mm -hmm. And if your function, it's very nice that you use uh, external calls. But if your functions download some data from external data, oh. then then in the second execution, your the data will be already there. Yeah. yeah. So will, I, will you consider that as well? Yeah. As I told you, we so for your second question, it's uh, that we want to exclude this from the measurements, and um, so you like subtract the the duration, the latency from the call from the overall execution to get rid of this, and the. First question, I forgot. Did you consider cold start? Yeah, um, we kind of consider cold starts here in the approach. Whoops. Where is it? Um, yeah, so the cold starts are part of the measurements, mm -hmm. but that's, um, so we don't want to exclude this the cold start there because they are already, so they are part of the application, right? So would you, when you, so, the benchmark should be realistic and calls that happen in production as well. So, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker is Jolutz. Good voila. I hope I said it okay. No, uh, but, 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 uh, Hello everyone, my name is uh, Yono, and uh, in this talk I will present a technique for leveraging intra-function parallelism in serverless machine learning. The main goal of this work was to port stateful machine learning algorithms to serverless. However, an issue is that serverless functions are not directly network addressable. Therefore, they cannot communicate with each other to share the state related to an iterative machine learning algorithm. Examples of shared state are the centroids in k-means clustering 
and the gradients in logistic regression. And for example, in k-means clustering, the serverless functions would have to update, the centroids would have to access the centroids from the shared state at every iteration of the algorithm. And uh, as the serverless functions are not directly network addressable, one would have to rely on a remote storage service for storing the shared state. And the issue with this is that it, it introduces an access latency as the serverless functions must access and update the remote storage at every iteration. And this can be problematic when running hundreds of iterations of a, a machine learning algorithm because you may get large overheads. And uh, this motivates our question, can intrafunction parallelism hide the access latency to the remote storage by taking advantage of multiple virtual CPUs? We used LitOps for this. Uh, we used LitOps to port k clustering on logistic regression to serverless, specifically to AWS. And uh, the nice thing about LitOps is that it provides a multiprocessing module that contains abstractions for enabling shared state among functions. And uh, in this figure, we have uh, uh, a concrete example of how this approach would look like. We would have different workers that compute some data of interest in parallel, for example, the centroids in k-means, and they would share the state in a Redis node. And after realizing the serverless implementations of k-means and logistic regression, uh, the next step was to adopt intrafunction parallelism. So the idea of intrafunction parallelism is to parallelize the computation phase of the algorithms. So in the computation phase, instead of using workers, we use inner workers. And in this figure, we have an example of this. Uh, here we have the serverless functions that would be launched, and each serverless function or each worker would launch a number of inner workers. And the number of inner workers is dictated by how many virtual CPUs each serverless function has. And then the inner workers would perform the computation of the algorithm. For example, in logistic regression, they would compute some partial results related to the partial gradients. And then after the inner workers have finished running the computation, they will send the results back to the workers, and then the workers would aggregate the received results. For instance, in logistic regression, they would aggregate the partial results of the partial gradients, and then the workers would communicate with the Redis node and update the global gradients. And the, the nice thing about this is that a higher level of parallelism can be achieved with a fewer number of connection points to the Redis node. So in this case, we achieve a level of parallelism of six by only having three connection points to the Redis node. So instead of having three connection, uh, six connection points, we only have three. So uh, this uh, results in a reduction of uh, overheads. And we carried out some experiments to evaluate our work. Uh, in the first experiment, we executed the k-means algorithm with a data set of 8 gigabytes and with a growing number of serverless functions from 50 up to 400. And each serverless function had six vCPUs allocated. And first, in the baseline instance, we executed the k-means algorithm without employing intrafunction parallelism. So although the serverless functions had six vCPUs allocated, we did not use them. We just used one as the serverless functions were executed sequentially. And then in the second instance, we executed again k-means by using two vCPUs, three vCPUs, up to six virtual CPUs. And here are the results of the experiment. On the x-axis, we have the number of workers. And on the y-axis, we have the performance improvement when leveraging intrafunction parallelism. And the colors represent how many virtual CPUs or how many inner workers we've used. And we, we have shown that uh, we get a performance improvement of 68% when using intrafunction parallelism. How to interpret this? What I show here is that when running the KMS algorithm with 50 workers or 50 serverless functions, and when using six virtual CPUs, I get a performance of 68% compared to when running 50 workers without intrafunction parallelism. So serverless functions that run sequentially. And in the second experiment, uh, this is motivated by the first experiment. One may argue that the previous experiment did not carry out a fair evaluation because uh, different levels of parallelism were achieved. For instance, I've compared 50 workers having six inner workers each with 50 workers. So in the first case, I had 300 virtual CPUs. 
used, but in the second case, I just had 50. So to have a fair comparison, this uh, experiment aims to evaluate the performance improvement when leveraging intrafunction parallelism while having the same level of parallelism. So we want to determine whether a better performance can be obtained when invoking 50 serverless functions, each with six vCPUs by leveraging intrafunction parallelism compared to when invoking 300 serverless functions, each with only one vCPU running sequentially. And as a baseline, the algorithm was executed with 300 workers, which where each uh, serverless function had one vCPU. And then we executed again the algorithm with 150 functions with two inner workers each, 100 workers, three inner workers each. So in all of these cases, we get a level of parallelism of 300. And we show that as the number of inner workers increases, and as the number of workers decreases, we get a performance improvement. And the reason for this is the reduction in synchronization overheads, because we have fewer connection points to the Redis node. So to conclude, we ported two stateful machine learning algorithms to serverless, k-means clustering, and logistic regression. And then we adopted intrafunction parallelism. We achieved the performance improvements of up to 68% when leveraging intrafunction parallelism. And we have also shown that from a performance perspective, it is preferable to execute a smaller number of multiple vCPUs workers than a larger number of single vCPUs workers because of the synchronization overheads. And that's it from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. No, no, just one. So the Redis server uh, was an EC2 instance of type uh, memory optimized of type R5 large. Uh, how many sites is Redis cluster? Because I guess it's not a cluster. It's just one Redis node. Yeah, but I mean, let's say that we make this a cluster, but guess what? How do you size this separated memory layer? Redis. Uh, yes, I've tried different Redis nodes of different sizes and see which one had better results while being cheap. But not much thinking has put into this, I would say. Okay, let's take a little bit wider again. Okay.
In the early stage, it is primarily to the forms and the structure and site, the first is the construction of heavy objects. However, it is involved in trying to form the transformation of the surface and the Virtually reducing the overhead of the system. Then, what the plus is based on the plan. Causes of the laboratory to judge about the respective event of the initial factor. The scale can increase the extent of the plan to the ground for the present demand for the sources of resources that churn the plot of the process. And the user will be paid for the actual business of the plan. The public say this cause of the paper of the gateway outline and the following for question. To address the current issue of the right of the public and not for the gap, we submit a page with regard to the SDF and to set the cause of our SDF. The data frequency was carried out from the environment for the SDF and SDF and the SDF. For models were used to be the For the visual application, those of the five are object detection and for the virtual process. This table shows the model size is different as well as the equipment of the size of the table. Those of the five use particular large team size compared to the other one. First, let's explore the new collection of GPS and GPS and GPS. Let me examine the first time for each result in the world of the team. The experiment involved four instruments replaced with three gigabytes of analog independent. The image classification will not exhibit a similar pattern with the SPF showing the fastest in this time. SPF is hard to listen for a PFC. Contributing by the first time due to the optimization model service number is provided. For Yolo V5 and R, SCS demonstrates the best in the first time. According to the investigation results, the outstanding performance is contributed to the latest generation Skylake SD because it was provided by the GCP Cloud. This is the support of the V5 to our control machine is designed to be capable of leading to significant performance improvement. Let's start a bit more into the impact of the CPS 512 on the current problems. For longer models, the performance improvement is greater than the CPS 512. Model can be compared to the certainly strong and poor logic station cover and similar models are judged to have a higher overhead to make the model overall more safe. In the case of smaller models, CM survey demonstrates better performance improvement compared to the different surveys of ISO and server. And then the flow to GPM. However, for larger models, where most of the time is spent in computation, the performance is reduced from the itself as significant with TM serving compared to using Python and SP. When deciding which software to use in the software development, it is crucial to understand and leverage these characteristics in the respective approach. Let's compare, now let's compare the cost constantly only the process time. From a cost perspective, SCS demonstrates the higher cost effectiveness, especially due to the high cost of the visual level of the scaling policy in the lower cost. Among the models, you don't need five standards to set it the dimension and SCS, but the cost shows the opportunity. This is because we will be five independently to match the group to the amount of data set, incorporating the handful execution time. Which includes additional data preparation time in the overall cost computation. Okay, let's start a closer look at the effect of the natural uh, network overhead in the MTF process. This figure compares the end to end target points. It incorporated not only the increased time as measured in the previous figure, but also including the job that is spectrum. 
things. One of the key factors in those is entropy in time of API and point protocol. GPM might be the of math for only US API. But SPM side of privatization workers use GRPC for transmitting input and output during the process. Yolo, we find a model of leveraging merger and input and output data sets showing a world run of different containers in the world. GRPC may use the protocol for and have a smaller data size when transmission compared to less, which support GPC, resulting in a less time consumption. The third question is about whether the number of instances in the world is more than Here it shows the optimized changes in SCS with vari variations in the numbers of inputs. The maximum recursion of the capacity for inputs in the lab located in here for smart The first bar represents the inverse time, the second bar represents the end time. The inverse time shows minimal variation because of the configurations. However, the typical changes were observed at the end to end time. Firstly, a decrease in the number of CPU force may lead to a longer end to end response time due to the request request that's the end engine. Secondly, when the instance and core count is the same, using more instances will to be a much more cost effective solution. In this context, the number of instances act as a decisive factor that changes in core count. However, using a larger number of instances may have a negative effect on performance and the external flows. This chapter covers the topics of the books. But until now, we have focused on cases involving growth term, but should be aware of the post term we have done. The lower portion of the calculated bar is present some model of the time. While the upper part indicates the time to get to the world, the computers and libraries necessary for providing the model. The bottom graph shows that it takes some time. If you have the GPS and the state of the computer libraries in the image, the computer will in time is relatively shorter compared to the other two. However, for due to the merger of these phases, a significantly larger amount of the learning of the computers. Additionally, SCS experiences a substantial number of the cold storm requests with nearly half of the requests are completed. People should be made to an issue related to cold storm and as well as cold storm. This way, I decided to answer an important question as a score of the characteristics of SCS, SCS, and SCS, and SCS, and SCS. I want to comment that the API has a point of the order. It was found that it was CPU for the device to get the capabilities of the core account is the same, using more of the more of the time. Also, I would that the full start is currently with a substantial version of the almost simply as a different and a good wish. I like to conclude the presentation and support to get any further questions with the same success. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so basically, the research is how are you going to change the general purpose uh, service for the framework to perhaps uh, remove those limitations? So how how we uh, expect the KPI to be able to see the Yes, exactly. So how exactly how can I perhaps improve like the general response and match the performance to the others? Because uh for GPF, SPF, and MPS for the description. Uh, the first general response is um, the number of program as it is this model for the registration of custom code rates between the number of the data and the state of the range of task. But as such a model class represents the database site in the current and the cloud version, this model is tailored for specific specialized tests 
offering the paper grades that um, become general for some of the But yeah, and SES is in software is something that the first one is just the cloud one and in from a set mother. It's more of a process of the cost of the computers, combining with the software services, the flexibility, or a copy of the can you can use these services and hopefully they have to do it. Thank you for the talk. And where's the record that you read in your scary stories about that? Uh, okay. I'll just shout. And where's the record that you ran most of your stories from Lambda? Or where did you run? Yes. Uh, can you yeah. Okay, I will use one of the experiments. Okay, yeah. I will apply with this pair. I use GPS for Lambda, and SCS for the and SCS for the Jessica Club. So, no, I was recently published a paper called Online Machine where they published that they can make full stars way quicker if you would put those steps by pushing actually the data to the So I'm kind of No, no, no. Just... Okay, ah, okay. I'll have a chronometer as well, but but no, no. Okay, so uh, mm. uh, one second. I don't know. I don't see any. Okay. Hmm? Is that one? That one, that one. There you go. Thank you. So, our next and final speaker of the session is Aurora Gonzalez Vidal. Hello, my name is Aurora. I'm a postdoc from the University of Murcia in Spain, and I would like to present on serving image classification models, work that has been developed. Uh, with Kier Geram from IBM Watson and Alexander Isenko from Technical University of Munich. The index is very straightforward. Let's start with the introduction. Up to 90% of the infrastructure cost for developing and running a deep learning application is spent on inference. And that makes uh, the need for model inference serving systems uh, to be scalable, to guarantee high system good good and maximize resource utilization across units. So the intention of this work is to set the foundations for model inference serving in serverless computing environments for the dynamic allocation of uh, resources according to the inference load request and the deadline guarantees. So as you can imagine, there are many factors that, are take, that must be taken into account. We want to analyze them and build up a generalizable optimization model to assist, uh, to assist in scaling decisions. And the use case is going to be image classification inference because it has many applications, such as in e-commerce, in social media, medical, medical image analysis, etc. cetera. Uh, if we categorize the types of inference according to the, the guarantees, we have four different kinds. It can be hard real-time inference where the result needs to be delivered in real time. 
soft real time where it's near real time, but it allows a certain small delay. Then we have a relaxed inference where the um, accuracy is uh, prioritized, uh, not, uh, not as important as the time. Time could be, we would be talking about hours. And then we have best effort inference where there are no specific resources uh, allocates for, for inference. And computer units uh, are composed by, a, by an array of hardware equipment. So we can count on uh, high performance computing ones as TPUs, GPUs, also CPUs and other peripherals can be as well of help for, for inference. And in our study case, we are going to come with one TPU and we are going to focus on uh, problems two and three, soft, real time and relaxed inference. Let's, let me introduce you the methodology. Um, first of all, we selected one image classification model, EfficientNet V0. EfficientNet are a family of convolutional neural network architectures that work very well for computer vision. They have very good characteristics, such as the fact that uh, efficiently, they efficiently scale the network's depth uh, with an, an resolution. And we chose the V0 because it's relatively lightweight, so five. And million parameters. Um, secondly, we created uh, dummy images with different input sizes because we wanted to measure the um, the input size, uh, the image input size uh, influence iso in, in an isolated way without the noise of having real images. We measure infrared times uh, repeatedly over different input sizes and minibat sizes, looking for dependencies in order to define functions. And while performing inference, we monitored uh, the hardware um, with uh, scripts that are available in the GitHub repository that you can see in the footnotes. Uh, it was prepared by my colleague Alexander Lysenko, and you can access to it and use it. Uh, we included many, many metrics such as TPU temperature, memory fragmentation, CPU parameters, and other metrics of the system, up to 164 features. Finally, with all these learnings, we propose uh, mathematical models for the optimization of the inference process. Um, we use the knowledge from the, from the experiments to, to define the decision variables, to create the const constraints, etc. So for results, here you can see uh, we are the memory usage in bytes uh, of, uh, of performing inference on images different input sizes from one to a thousand and for uh, several minibat sizes. So you can see that basically the input size has no influence in the memory usage because it's constant through time, at least on the minibat sizes that are tested here. But uh, of course, as the bulk of images uh, increases, uh, we see that more memory is used. Something similar uh, is shown here where we are measuring the inference time across the while changing uh, the input size, uh, we see some very constant behavior, except that from a certain combination of a minibat size, the higher one in this case, and the input size, it explodes, it stops behaving as normal. So this may suggest that uh, there is a maximum minibat size that we have to account for in order to believe that there is this constant, um, uh, this constant behavior for the input size. Then uh, we went for the for test testing with minibat sizes with higher minibat sizes. Here you can see the inference time with different uh, minibat sizes, and we repeated the, the experiments for each minibat size ten times. You can see here there is almost a linear behavior um, uh, disrupted by a certain certain points, especially here, and. Um, well, we realized with this that these points uh, correspond to the first attempt of measuring the, the time uh, or, or perf performing inference, which means that the warm up uh, is independent for each uh, minibat size. So every time we change the minibat size, the GPU needs to, to warm up. If we uh, erase these points, we find a relation, that, like a, a perfectly linear uh, relation. So we can think that there is a warm up time dependent on the minibat size plus a linear relationship uh, on, on, again, depending on the minibat size for the sign. So in order to characterize this, uh, this warm up, uh, we measured the, um, 
this those switches that I that I introduced uh, before, just before performing the the inference before the uh, before the one we know. and uh, we we used random forest to try to determine if uh, or to try to estimate the inference time of the warm up. And uh, we use random forest just because it uh, provides with this ranking of uh, features. And uh, let me comment that the four more importance that we, we, we saw was involuntary switches. Uh, a high number of those can indicate system bottlenecks. Then obviously mini bat size has a big influence and uh, GPU memory, GPU current memory, both requested and allocated as well. So this will help. This ha this helped us uh, for defining later on the, the optimization problem. So for the definitions that we need for the problem, uh, we have as decision variables um, the number of uh, times that a GPU is used. Because for the optimization, we are gonna imagine that we have available several GPUs. So each of them is GPU Y, right? Uh, so we have the number of times that this is used, its minibat size, and the number of GPUs to be used. That's a decision. As constraint, as constants, we have the total available time for the request, the number of images that need to be processed, maximum number of GPUs, maximum number of times that the GPUs can, that a GPU can be used, and the images uh, input size for such a GPU. And then we have the functions, the latency per minibat size, the warm up as well per minibat size, and the maximum minibat size for a GPU. For the soft real-time inference case, we have uh, we would like to minimize the number of GPUs that is used, while uh, assuring that we will uh, in, uh, perform inference in at least n images. That is what we need, and we assume that the GPUs are used um, at the same time. So, uh, the maximum time for warm up per, per minibat size plus the times that uh, that the batches are inferenced has to be smaller than the time t. And for constraints, well, the mini bat size has to be smaller than the than the than the one that we should determine. The number of times smaller than the number of times that the GPU can be used, and the number of GPUs as well as smaller than the number of GPUs that we have. For the relaxed inference case, we, it's like a sub subtype or like a particular case where we want to use all the GPUs that are available. So we want to maximize the number of images that are uh, inference that are like pass through the system, having the constraints of time, of maximum minibat size and maximum times to be used. Uh, so as a conclusion, we have established a, a foundation for exploring the optimal way of serving AI models for image inference serving, determining some, uh, determining some functions. And of course, this opens a lot of future work in which some of it we're already working, such as finding the optimal minibat size or maximum minibat size as well, uh, to incorporate load times for the models and for the images, um, measure or find out how to tackle concurrency, meaning like having more than one model in the same GPU, using more heterogeneous uh, hardware, so mixing different hardware, so solving these optimization problems and also adapting our system to other uh, to other systems that, for example, can choose the deep learning model according to the to the user needs. Uh, so integrated in all, with other with other systems. So thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, how uh, will your model change uh, in the case that the model itself is complete in the GPU's memory? Uh, so, you know, we have this large image models, and even in inference, there are many cases that you cannot really fit everything. I don't know if you have, if you are able to model those. We have not experimented with it, so, but. Uh, mm, I don't know if we can like fragmentate it in a way so that we we use we split it in different GPUs, but it will of course it will change, and we have to perform experiments to 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 really see how to incorporate that in our in our system. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? The, if you have the advisory, this URL is not visible. Is it Alex? 
Is it is it is a different one now? Okay. Can I check here? Uh, maybe so it's it's it should be. Thank you. Maybe you wrote it like maybe you didn't let me let me show it to you. Oh I don't see it now anymore. It's okay, it was Zoom's fault. Uh, any more questions? I have one question. Yes. How, what's your insight on how much are you learning about the workloads versus how much are you learning about the specifics of that GPU model? Because, you know, more memory, faster memory, yeah, it's yeah. a mix, it's complicated. I would like to incorporate the GPU's characteristics to this, to this uh, research. I mean, it could be also tailored a lot towards the model, for example, like I've seen that the input size does not have a influence, but it could be dependent on, on how the model scales things. So uh, it, it's just something to be further researched. But it's, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Okay. Thanks.